I just will look at them and say, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that what you have inside of you that's locked away, first of all, couldn't change one life, which I guarantee you it probably would. Just one person will find inspiration, motivation, and probably be inspired to tell their story because you told yours. Welcome to Conversation for the Soul. I'm Linda Christine. Today, I had a wonderful conversation with Greg Gonzalez. Greg is a connection coach, a life writer, and a modern day monk. Isn't that interesting? He uh, is the creator and founder of the Speak Easy Method, where he assists people in expressing themselves in every which way you can imagine. Um, we talk about that today, and we talk about some of the struggles that people have expressing their ideas. And let me tell you, Greg is a guy of limitless ideas. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Before we get, begin, I'm going to ask you to please like, share, and subscribe. This is the way these beautiful stories get heard, and these stories make wonderful teachers. So please join me in sharing and liking and subscribing, and we will begin with our conversation today with Greg. Greg, it's so great to have you here today. Thank you for joining me. It's absolutely a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Linda. Oh, I love it. So... I was introduced to you through a friend and I um, withheld from finding out about you. So I'm going to get to know, get to know you here along with everybody else. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. So I, I'm going to start with a little bit. I have mixed feelings about the word awakening, but we're all in some kind of unfoldment some kind of journey right now, awakening, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Um, you're in that mode too, I get the sense. And I'm wondering, when did that all start for you? What was the catalyst or were there multiple catalysts for your awakening? That's a great question. Um, for me, awakening has taken on different levels and different stages. And it's been um, painful at times, but at the same time, very enlightening. I spent over 20 years in um, wellness health field. Uh, I was a massage therapist and I also managed and operated spas and um, loved it, just absolutely loved it. And I think on the surface, people would just assume the type of work that I was in, the environment, that it just came naturally to just be in that zen-like, mindful, connecting space. I was really just on autopilot. And um, I loved what I did. I had a very busy, thriving practice and um, was grateful for it. But I never really stopped to ask why. And the why was more of like, why am I doing this? And so I, I had done that for almost two decades. And then in 2018, I started noticing my hands started hurting a lot. Um, they eventually started going just completely numb. And I would be working on someone and I couldn't feel what I was doing. And it just, it was just scary. I'd never ex experienced anything like that. Went in and got diagnosed with severe carpal tunnel in both of my wrists. And they suggested surgery, which I did. Was unsuccessful. They did it again. And it was at the second one that the doctor recommended that I find a new profession. And it was... It was my livelihood, but it was honestly more than that. I knew it was something that um, that I was good at. I felt validated. I felt needed. And I felt like I was providing help. But again, I even at that point, I didn't really understand why. What was the why? And so when I went through the recovery of surgeries and my wrists were bandaged up, I went through just a, a mild depression, not quite a dark night of the soul, but it felt very much like that. And I started asking myself some really hard questions. And I started investigating that I really wasn't as connected to my work as I should have been. I wasn't as mindful in that space as I could have been. I was just a machine. You know, I was seeing like seven, eight people a day and just overdoing it. Grateful that people wanted to come, but I just, I would just always say yes. So my boundaries were nothing. When it all came to an end, that was when I had to stop and, and ask, 
not just the why, like really get to the why, but like what's next. And what's next had to understand like, why did people come to me? And what I came up with was three things. They were either in pain, they were stuck, or they just wanted to maintain and continue to feel good. They were, they just felt connected to themselves and it was just a space for them to just escape, to just feel good, feel within themselves. So I started doing some journaling and it was hard for me to answer some questions of just what's next. And I came up with about a dozen journal prompts and I just, I couldn't answer them. And then one day it just dawned on me, well, I wonder how other people would answer these questions just to get some other insights. So on a whim, I reached out to a handful of clients who I hadn't seen in a while. And so, for example, I'd say, Linda, hi, it's, you know, it's, it's been, I know, a while, probably wondering whatever happened to me, but would you mind meeting me for coffee? And I'd like to interview you. And they'd be like, what for? And I'm like, I don't know. I just have some questions I just would love to ask you. And so we would meet and I would ask questions like, how do you define joy? What gets you out of bed each day? Um, what does a meaningful life look like to you? Um, things like that, you know, just very seemingly simple questions, but questions that kind of make people go, hmm, you know, and then they would share and they would open up and they would tell a story with each answer, it seemed like. And I would sit back and just be in utter amazement at what people that I knew for years would share about themselves they would transform in front of me as they talked too. So I saw just this energy and this light that started shining out of them. Like they, they just, they radiated just positivity. And some of the questions opened up some, um, some areas of their heart where it was emotional. They would just kind of go there and I would just create that space for them to share. But it was fascinating to just witness that and be a part of that and to provide that outlet and so with one particular client I was asking these questions with, it was one of my older clients and she had been a devoted massage client for years and uh, started asking her these questions and everyone pretty much got the same questions, but the answers were so different, so varied. It was just amazing to hear the variety of responses. Well, this particular client, Betty, went through a roller coaster of emotions with me and like just the hour we had together, she just was laughing in tears, um, you know, just would have these moments of silence of just really contemplating her answer. And then what she would share would just be so magical. And so the last question we finished up with, and she's wiping tears away, and I'm kind of tidying up the area, and she reaches over and touches my hand. And she's like, it just dawned on me what you're doing, Greg. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm just asking questions. I'm just doing <laughs> these interviews and I'm loving. She's like, no. When I was on your table, when I would come in to see you, you just intuitively knew where to go. You didn't have to ask where I was in pain. How am I feeling? You just knew. And with your intuition and the space you created, you were able to untie the knots and take away the pains that I had in my body. What you just provided for me in this space here is you untied knots and took away pain in my heart and my soul. And I feel like it's no different what I feel now than when I was on your table. And it was like, you know, I started crying, <laughs> you know, it was like, oh my God, you know, creating that bridge between what I had done that I was kind of disconnected to, to work that I now felt just a huge sense of purpose and meaning, just the space, that connection with people. And then it just recently an awakening that just happened recently was this realization that what I do now is I take away pain. I help unstick, untie knots for people that are stuck, but I also do maintenance. I help people just remain and stay better and continue to thrive and reach their higher self. So, so in many ways I'm doing what I'm doing, what I had done for 20 years, but I'm just not hurting my hands doing it. It's more energetic. So very, very long story. I would say the awakening has been an evolution of that time to get to the realization that I was purposeful in what I was doing. I just didn't know it at the time. And now I feel like the awakening has taken place of the higher meaning of what truly being connected to myself 
is first and then taking that connection to those that I serve. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. You know, it's amazing to me. Um, and I, I love all those, those, uh, there's a few books, I think on finding your why that's out mm -hmm. there. And so many people just kind of go on autopilot through life without ever figuring out why am I doing this? Why am I in this career? They just kind of haphazardly fall into all this stuff and it creates so much pain and misery. And eventually our soul and our body that know this are going to shift us out of that space. Kind of like you got shifted out of it because there was something more meant for you. I, I actually think my wrists went out on purpose. I actually think it was God and the universe saying you're, you're you've done enough now. You, I think I literally, I've sat down and figured out over the almost 20 years of doing massage work, the thousands of people that I literally touched. And I took it as a sign that it's time to touch more people. Like, this is good. This is meaningful. You did great. Pat on the back. Now it's time to get serious and do something more, um, more impactful. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it feels like now. What have you seen as far as uh, like when you were interviewing people, did you ever come across anybody that was kind of like really having a hard time answering those simple questions? Because when you're not conscious, when you're not aware of what you're even doing every day in life, you don't think about those things. So you don't have an answer for a lot of those questions. Did you run into any of that? I will honestly say, Linda, I don't think I've ever had someone just say, I've got nothing. I've had people where it takes them time. Yeah. I and that. I think that that is part of what I have learned doing this work of, of holding space for people, asking questions, creating conversations, and um, the clarity that comes from it is that with some questions, people need a little time. And I think that's something that it goes both ways. I think for the person asking the question, we're trying to get to the answer. And so we either say, okay, let me rephrase it this way, which I've done sometimes, but we almost are like feeding them answers to get them to talk, you know, to get to, because I think uncomfortable silence for some people is just unbearable. I have learned to embrace the silence and that when you just allow someone to sit, and, and this is always a tell for me. So when I ask a question and they look up, and they're like, oh, you know, when sometimes people do that, they look up. I take it as that they're looking to God for answers mm -hmm. or they're looking to spirit. You know, it's kind of like because they don't you don't ask them a question and they go, you know, like <laughs> they immediately raise their eyes. And I just I do. I feel like it's it's in search of. And I've just learned to just be quiet, just be still. And every time that happens. Every time that happens, I'm literally blown away with what they say because it just, it, it just took a little bit of, I, th I see it as this, and this is really the goal and the mission of what I'm trying to get to is um, I'm on this mission to redefine AI for people. You know, it's been such a hot topic with chat GPT and people are thinking it's going to take over the world and da, da, da. So I, I define AI as attention and intention. And so it's what you th are thinking about is the attention that you put on something, but the intention is what you feel about it. And so when I'm working with people, part of it is training them to work on making that connection of the head and the heart when a question comes in. And I feel like sometimes that connection takes a little bit, but when it hits and then it reaches their throat and it comes out, it's magic. I mean, it's, it's absolute pure magic. So I encourage people when... You know, when, when you're asking someone a question and the person responding doesn't have something right away, just give it a little time. Just just create that space and, and allow that silence to just work itself out if they need a little guidance and just say, sometimes you might need to rephrase it. Um, but I have just found more often than not to just be still, be just a really good listener. And sometimes listening in silence is the most important thing. So right about now, people are probably going, 
what the heck is this guy's career path? Everybody's trying to figure it out. We should <laughs> probably we should probably talk about that a little bit, you know, so <laughs> they can get some context around all of this beautiful information that you're sharing. Yeah. So I um I have developed so again, another awakening that has come recently is um the method that I use for my work now. Um the 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 company that I operate is called Speakeasy Media. And the speakeasy method is how I do what I do. So the method is kind of my own formula. I guess you could say it's kind of my, um, the magic behind what happens. AI is part of that magic, the attention and intention to the work. Um, But the awakening that came to me recently is like when I was doing massage, you know, I went through years of training of deep tissue and kinesiology and acupressure and cranial sacral. And so I feel like the speakeasy method is my modality that I use. It's my technique. Um, and I define it very simply is that it's AI plus the four C's that make the speakeasy method work. And I kind of explained it. So it's compassion, the space that you create for someone. Curiosity is the question you bring in, the conversation that arises from that question, and then clarity is the insight and the wisdom from the answer. And that is really what I do in my work with people. I love to ask questions. I I, I get to be my my five-year-old self where I just was asking everybody a million questions and kind of being that annoying little kid, but I, I did it out of pure interest. Like I love to learn about people. And so when I sit and I meet someone and ask them a question, my, my favorite question lately is who inspires you and why? Instead of like, what do you do? I, I'll like just meet someone and just be like, can you tell me who, who right now inspires you the most? And if you can give me three qualities as to why they do. And then people, you know, are taken aback and they share and and it tells me something about them. They're telling me a story about them. And it could be like their mom or their dad or Oprah or, you know, whomever. But the qualities they share are qualities that they're describing about themselves or qualities they're looking to strengthen in themselves. So they're telling me so much more than just what they do. And I just love this idea of storytelling through questions and creating that space that makes it safe and open and trusting for people to share. And so what I do with the speakeasy method is I help people tell their story. And so it can be a story to share. Um, The majority of my work is I help people who, who want to write a book, but sit at a computer screen and they start to write and they're like, I hate this, (laughs) this is too hard. You know, they start writing, they're deleting, they're self-editing. A lot of times people are just doubting their story. Like, who's gonna care about this? This is just me. This is just one little piece of my life. What what does this matter? Um, And then some people just see it as just, you know, uh, the investment of just the time and energy to write a book. And so I just knock all that down. I allow people the opportunity to write with their voice. So I do recording sessions where I ask questions about the story they want to tell. And I record it, we transcribe it, they get all the media associated with it. So the video, the audio, the transcripts that's edited, formatted for them so they can move things around. It's basically creating a first draft in hours and days versus weeks and months, maybe even years. So I'm kind of that spark to get the story out. And I think of my work as like spiritual archeology. span And that the questions that I use are the tools to help people dig deeper within themselves. Wow. Wow. That's, (laughs) that's pretty incredible. Now. So you're basically helping authors. What's uh, what's, what's the book that Greg has hidden within? Oh, wow. So, (laughs) so the book that's in me that I'm currently writing and I'm using the method on myself because I'm not a, a writer. Um, but I'm a talker, as you can tell. Um, I'm working on something. I, I've done a, a children's book. It was a children's book at the time because they were younger, but for my girls. And this was right after um, there was a, a horrible school shooting at Parkland, Florida in 2018. This was literally right after my surgeries. And um, so it was kind of a crux of a period of my emotions, putting questions together, questioning what's next for me. 
it witnessing this horrible tragedy, but it was really reading a book that changed my life. Um, I keep it right here in my desk just for this per- very purpose. Um, the Book of Joy. Uh, um, finished this book in like four days and then Parkland happened. So it was kind of a mixture of emotions and feelings mm-hmm. of this horrible tragedy, but then this, how do we find sustainable joy in moments of tragedy like that? And so I wanted to basically explain this book to my girls who were fairly young at the time. So I wrote a story for them that explains the eight pillars of joy that they talk about. So it's called the eight stones. Um, It's currently in an ebook form. It's just, I'm not selling it. I'm literally giving it away. I'm going to send you a copy when I'm done. Um, But it was just, it was me writing, but speaking and filling in some holes with just downloads. And then I would talk, transcribe it and kind of, again, use it as a first draft. So the story that's in me now is I'm so aware of just the lessons that I've learned. Um, And it could be quotes that we find. It could be passages from books. It could be an audio piece that we hear. And I'm just, you talked about awareness and awakening. Like I am so tuned in to the messages that are impactful for me, but I want to pass them down to them. So I'm literally collecting in this particular journal here. I kind of call it my spirit book, but I'm going to record all of my downloads, quotes, passages, lessons, guides, just things. And this is going to be basically like my my legacy piece for them um, of like lessons from dad. And, you know, hopefully it's something that they, um, you know, when I'm no longer here, they'll have my voice, they'll have my face, because I'm going to basically do it in a video audio book form. Um, and then have it transcribed in an ebook. So we'll have kind of multiple uh, ways of doing it, which is like what Speakeasy Media does. But so that's something that for me personally is just a more of a passion project for them. It's not really in me to write books to sell. I want to help others get their story out. That's more meaningful to me. So to help you, to help others who, it doesn't have to be a book. Uh, I've helped people write blogs, create TED Talks, um, create courses for people, um, white pages, articles, just if you've got a message, you've got something inside you that can help people, but you just are stuck with like, it's all just rummaging around in my head and my heart. I'll just ask them, join me on, on zoom. And let me ask you some questions. And then I'm going to ask more questions to pull more of the story out and we record it, capture it. And then I hand it back to them be like, now go share it. You just did it. You just wrote your talk. You just created your blogs, like months of blogs with your voice because it's all just being transcribed. So that interests me more than the story I want to share. My stories are more for um, right now, like for my girls, I would say. That's beautiful. Something about that is, is um, it hits home for me because when I am out in the woods um, or I'm out hiking, I'll get messages out in nature and I'll talk them into my phone because it's like a stream of consciousness coming from source, coming from guides, coming wherever it comes from. It doesn't really matter, but it's beautiful information to be shared. So mm-hmm. using the technology in that way is is so perfect because it's less daunting than sitting there. Yeah. in front of a computer, you know, or, or sometimes like just writing typewriter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I keep a journal with me all the time, but I, I'm like you, I walk. That's when my downloads come is when I'm outside yeah. every morning and having my phone, it's just filled with audio pieces. And that sometimes it could be two seconds. Sometimes it's just me rambling on for like two, three minutes. Um, I had one yesterday of just a concept that I want to do that literally came as I'm on the middle of a walk. Wasn't even looking for it. It just came. And I immediately had to start recording because it was just fresh. Like you said, it's like, it's downloading, got to capture it. Got it. It's a message from God. It's a message from source, not going to lose it. And so that's part of what's so great about what I do with people is, is that we'll spend like an hour or so in these recording sessions, but I'll say to them, don't, the story's not going to stop when we hit stop on the recorder. 
like keep a notepad by you at all times. Keep your phone with your voice recorder app close by because you've kind of started opening doors of your heart and soul that maybe you hadn't before. Your body, the somatic energy that's it's being released from you talking about this now, it's it's going to start flooding. And, and I do. I have people who message me a day or two later going, oh my God, the stuff that's coming out, <laughs> you know? And so the creativity, this, the, the, I love, again, that spark, flow, energy, create, it's just, it's all part of it, but it's also healing and nurturing. And really what I'm after with, with any of my work is just, I see the best versions of people when they open up like that. And so to me, I see that as like self-mastery like your true voice, your true heart, your true story that I feel like so oftentimes we don't think matters. We don't think anyone cares about, let alone ourselves. But then when you say it and you're in that space and you're, you feel seen and heard and valued and it's beautiful what comes out, I'm like, I should be paying you. Like that was a pleasure to just be a witness to. So that's, I'm capturing content to sh- to give you back so you can do with it as you will and whatever medium it's going to be, a book, a blog, a podcast, whatever. I really want the person to understand the method that was just used to get you to share that. Now I want you to give that to someone else. Now that you've just experienced it, now go create that space for a family member or someone at work who's struggling. Or maybe I tell my girls all the time, that kid in the lunchroom, who sits by themselves, who you know, no one talks to, create space for them. Ask them how they're doing. Do you want to talk? Create a conversation and help them find clarity and um, just love within themselves and and with you. Like it's, it's a method, but it's, it's a way of connection that I, I truly feel like that's what I want to teach. That's more important to me than anything. Um, And so it's, it's kind of a combination of, I think of it as like first aid training, you know, first responder training for people. You know, when you see someone struggling, I've just given you the tools. I've just explained it. You just felt it. You just did it. Now go give that care to someone who needs it. So I kind of want it to be obviously a value to you personally, but let it be a ripple and and continue to cascade to help others. Mm, That's so beautiful. So you're a really good teacher, it sounds like. And a lot of times, good teachers also learn great lessons from their students. What are some of the beautiful golden nuggets that you've gotten from your folks that were just like, oh, wow, what an aha moment? Yeah. Um. So the whole reason why I started asking my previous clients questions was because I struggled with the answers. And so their response to my questions provided clarity. And for me, it opened my eyes and my perspective of, I didn't even think of it that way. So each time I'm with someone, whether it's a discovery call and I ask just kind of an intro question, or if we're really getting into the heart of your story that um, is painful and, um, you know, it's therapy in a lot of ways. I grow so much from what people share. Um, again, it's that it's that human mastery in action. Like seeing somebody show up as the best version of themselves is reaffirming to me. Of I almost feel like it's it. I feel like it's a mirror of who I want to be. I want to show up as the best version of myself. Um, I've had answers to questions that people have shared that just totally changed the way I believed and felt about things. Um, you know, cause we just get kind of caught up in this is the way I think this is the way I, the way I was taught, you know, past behaviors and, and belief patterns. And then someone will answer a question that totally is unlike anything you've ever heard. And I'm just like, I like that. I think that's what I believe too. You know, so I just feel like I always am just wiser and just more clear. And, um, and, and I, I also, it just gives me such faith in just the human being of, you know, when people 
step into this space and share. And I say this about everyone. Everyone loves to talk about themselves. People will say they don't, but when they're given the opportunity and the invitation, <laughs> holy cow, they will talk. And one of my favorite quotes, and I, I over talk about this, but I love this quote so much, is anything will give up its secrets if you love it enough. And I just think at the end of the day, we all want to be loved. We all want to be seen and heard because we all have something to say. And so for me, this idea of helping teach people mastery through your voice, through your story, through connection is really what, what this is about. Because I, I want people to see the beauty in themselves, to acknowledge the amazing answers that you just gave me could change someone's life, literally. Someone who's struggling, hearing what you just said is the best advice, lesson, teaching that they would ever get. And then they sit back and like, yeah, I think you're right. You know, so so that that to me is what I gain so much. Um, I'm so much smarter because of the people that I get to work with. <laughs> you know, I read all the time. I absorb information. I try to apply as as much as I can of it. My best teachings come from the people I get to work with, and they're everyday people. They're ordinary people who say extraordinary things. It's so true because stories are the greatest teachers, and that's exactly why I do this podcast. It's fun and I love mm -hmm. it. And I always say when it stops being fun, I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> but the wisdom that comes out of the people I talk with and their stories are so heartfelt and enlightening. I just love it. Yeah. I, and I, I think that that's the power of questions. I think questions are the answer. I think that if we became more curious and less judgmental, thank you, Ted Lasso, um, I really do. I, I see. Yeah. I mean, there's so many lessons from that, that just when, when I watch that show, I'm like, it's like, it's like my show. It's like, they're talking my language, <laughs> but I do. I believe firmly that if we just became more curious and not judgmental of people, we could eliminate stigma, polarization, hate, um, just the way our society kind of just unfortunately is right now. Um, I've had visions of wanting to take the speakeasy method and teach it at the UN and like just bring world leaders together and be like, okay, I'm going to teach you guys AI and the four C's before you go into negotiations and peace plans and treaties and all that. We're going to just learn how to connect and just make it really simple. We're going to start micro. So yeah, it has to start with you creating space within yourself, okay. asking the question, conversation with yourself, clarity within. Now it extends to one other person and then two, four, six, eight, and beyond. So it's like this micro to macro approach is the way that I like to. And when I do workshops, I mean, that's kind of how I do it is it starts with one and then we bring one person in, add more until eventually the whole group is together and we're connecting. Um, I've seen it. It, it, it's totally possible, but um, for me, it's 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 this idea of using questions as I don't like the the term weapon, just as more of a um, a way to kind of just pierce through the polarity to just be more open because we're not trying to change minds. We're not trying to get you to believe what I believe. You know, if you're red and I'm blue and you know, I don't even want to talk to you. It's like, can we come to the middle and just connect and let me understand why you believe what you believe? And maybe along the way, we'll find, hey, you know what? I love that football team too. Oh, my parents live in your hometown. Something that can at least create a space that we can have those conversations and understand one another. I, I don't agree with you, but I understand you. That to me would be a great place to start. You know, I remember when I was younger, you said red and blue, this triggered it. My my dad was Republican and my mom was Democrat. And they would argue over their candidates and their choices, but they were married and they were together and they agreed to disagree. And in the end, it really didn't matter. What happened to that? Yeah. What, what's, what's your thoughts on why is that gone now? I think that um, I see it as just we we get comfortable, um, I, and I also think we're we're 
unfortunately controlled by fear. Um, I'm a big believer that there's really two main energies that are the greatest teachers in our lives. It's love and fear. And so I kind of think of it as like the angels on the shoulder, right? The good angel, the bad angel. I think that we've become a society that's just very fear-based. And I would attribute any negative emotion of hate, of frustration, of stagnation, any Asian, <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, you could put anxiety, stress, all those things. I mean, those are, I think, centered around fear. And what I've learned, another awakening, to go back to the beginning for me, is that when I feel stress, when I start to judge, because we all do it, you know, even the best of us, I don't try to find the other side of that coin necessarily of like, okay, what's the opposite of hate? What's the opposite of anger? What's the opposite of, of judgment? To me, the opposite of all of it is love. Just replace it with love. And that is something that I am, along with AI, really trying to teach to my girls. You know, my, my oldest is getting ready to start high school. My youngest is midway through middle school, just really trying times. And they come home with different teenage angst and, and questions and frustrations. And I see it and I, and I hear about it with just the, their friends. And I try to just be a vessel for them to share with their friends of just, just be more loving, just be kind to yourself first. And then just, just replace any of that with love. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in let it be, let it go, let it in. Got to accept what is, if, if you can't change it, you just have to accept it and just let it be. And then let go of the attachment of whatever that feeling is, the stress, the anger, the frustration. But then letting it go creates kind of a hole, right? And it's hard to do that. Got to fill that hole with something good. And that's love. So it's kind of like pulling a weed out. That's the, the fear. That's the anger. Fill it with love. Plant a tree, plant a rose, put something in there that can grow in its place. And I just, I think that that is just a concept that people like us, we can talk about and we're like, okay, I get you. It's, it's the people who are just very fear-based and it's hard to get them to even come to the table to even just understand like, what does love feel like for you? And, and there's no right or wrong answer. Just what does that feel like? And what would it feel like to replace that feeling of tension and anxiety and fear with love? Just try it. Just, just take like a minute and just sit with that. And that to me, I think is a, is a place to start. Well, Greg, you're the perfect person to answer this because as I, I look at everything that you're saying and I feel into it, it's a feminine concept and I can grasp that. And there are a lot of women in this awakened community, but the men are slow to come. How do you take a soft or what's perceived as soft? Because I get love is everything. It's, it's all it's God for me. Mm -hmm. um, I get that. So how do you, how do you get the masculine to embrace their feminine right. and be accepting of this and drop down in, into the heart space. So I love working with men. Some of my most amazing story projects have been from men who very atypical CEO kind of a brain type, you know, very, very just kind of heady who Again, you know, when I think back of just those three categories of people that I help, you know, people in pain, people that are stuck, people are looking to maintain. And some guys kind of fit all three of those categories, right? They're in yeah. tremendous amounts of pain, but it's so suppressed, right? They can't even think about acknowledging it. They're stuck in the sense that like, I'm good, but not always so great, right? Like I have some days where I feel like I'm good, but you know, I get really anxious and stressed. And then you get these guys who are like, you know, I take care of myself. I eat well, I work out. I, you know, I've got a great set of friends and, and whatnot. And I just, I, I, I know I can be better though. Like this is good, but it could be better. 
I always just bring it back to just tell me what you were like when you were young. You know, just what, what did you, what were you into when you were young? What sort of interests caught your eye? You know, and they'd be like, oh, you know, I was really into cars. Like, oh, what kind of cars? Like, oh, like matchbox cars. You know, I'd collect those. And then it turned into, um, you know, making model cars. I'm thinking of one person in particular I worked with. That was literally like the hammer that just cracked that egg wide open because then it just, it allowed the next question to come in of what, what did you think was possible when you were a teen? Like, what were you thinking about doing? Was it what you're doing now? So, oh no, no. I had a whole nother career path and da, da, da. I'm like, tell me about that. You know what? You just, you create that space. You create that conversation with someone who I think for guys, they need to feel safe. Very much so. I think women are much more trusting and they 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 kind of have a way of just almost having like a welcome mat in some ways. They're guarded in some cases, but I think women just naturally are nurturing and allowing people in. Guys need to feel safe. And I think that my approach is one of, I don't talk very heady. I just show up as me. Very matter of fact, I make eye contact. I think that they get a sense that I'm genuine and authentic and I'm not trying to manipulate them, not trying to hurt them. I think they see me as like, hey, he's a good guy, you know? Um, that particular guy in particular, he ended in tears. Like literally just like, I'd be asking him a question and he would just be like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and what started coming out of him was, it, it was all around self-love, just a lack of. And so that's what we spent his story project on is telling his, the love story of himself that's missing. And it was beautiful. Yeah. And it was absolutely like, um, again, seeing the best version of him that I don't think he'd even seen, which was just, it just took some questions and some space. Um, I'm still in touch with him. His wife like thanks me all the time. <laughs> like, just, you know, you he's... cracked him wide open, didn't you? <laughs> well, and that's the thing. When you tell your story, when you allow yourself to be vulnerable, um, and and courageous, it it it's transformative. It literally can sh shift. You know, I think about this work as is like I help people who struggle with filling a page. With, by using their voice, you know, when you see a blank page, we can fill it, but it's also about flipping the script. We can change patterns and behaviors. We can change the story. We can change the, the narrative and the ending or the perceived ending that you're, you're wanting. It's all vocal journaling in a lot of ways, but it's storytelling as well. And so I treat each question as like we're building chapters of a book. And um, it's remarkable what people share. And the guys, like I said, I think that it's it's coming in. Just just don't be fearful. There's nothing scary about this. But sometimes I'll ask you, what scares you? What keeps you up at night? And they feel trusting enough to share. I don't think they've ever like they will say it to themselves, but they would never share it outwardly. That kind of outward expression. They're like, wow, I really said that. <laughs> yeah, you kind of went there. So we need that. I, we, we really we need, need we, more of that. Yeah. And I think for, for men, um, fortunately, at least the ones that I'm encountering, that there there seems to be more of an openness. So because I think that just this way of, you know, gotta be the provider, gotta be the tough guy, gotta keep it together. Like those are the ones that are like their their eggshells are like this then. And it just takes someone with the courage to just come in and just give it a little tap. And then it's just this, what pours out is what needs to come out in order for them to find, you know, to self-master themselves. So I love this idea of self-mastery. This has been a recent thing for me. And I think that for both men and women, we're all in search of that. And it's not just, it's not like we want to be perfect. We're just seeking to be our best, the best versions of ourselves. And I think a great way to do that is this. Just ask, what does that look like? What does that feel like? 
when have you felt at your best? When were you at your best recently? Um, and just sit back and just let them share. I'm like, what would happen if that happened all the time? You know, how much would that change the trajectory of your life? Um, so I think that for both men and women, it, it's all about safety. It's all about trust. Um, and that's part of, again, what I want to teach people is when you show up for people, create that compassionate space that's trusting, non-judgmental, open, um, just kindness, just general kindness. Just be kind when you show up for people. You know, I'm not out to <laughs> change you. I just want you to be you. I just want you to express yourself without any, like unapologetically, just be you. Say what you need to say. And your answer today, I could ask you the same question today in a month. It could be a totally different answer because you're a totally different person then. Doesn't mean one's different or better. It's just, this is where you are. So it's all about the here and now, present moment. Let's figure out where have you been? Where are you going? But I really want to know where you're at. And those are the questions that I love to ask the most. Mm. As a dad, how how do you apply all of this to your daughters and help them be better people and grow into the great people that they are? So I always say that having children is like the greatest Jedi master training course you could ever have because <laughs> holy crap, they yeah. are like my Buddhas teaching me all the time, every day. Patience. <laughs> Patience is like the biggest <laughs> one. Um, I mean, they really do. They they inspire me to be better. You know, you talk about mastery, like to be like a master dad. It's not that I am, am ever going to get there, but the journey to get there is what's fulfilling. To feel like I can show up for them fully, be present, be a good listener, be a good engager with them, um, keep them active, let them know that they're loved. Um, there's little things that I just am constantly, it's a practice, but it's not forced. And that to me is, is where I feel like the people who are masters in their craft, whether it's art, whether it's, you know, music, painting, sports, business. I think any of them would say that it's the daily practice. It's the day-to-day -day work that no one sees. And I think parenting is no different. It's, it's the little things you do that when you show up and it's showing up, it's, it's making the decision to show up and saying to yourself, what's, what's a priority for me? What's important to me? And so every day I start my day, I'm, I'm up super early most days. I feel like a monk. And I start with three main questions for myself. And I've gotten better about answering my own questions now. I haven't struggled as much with that, but I still do. But the three questions I start my day with is, how can I be more healthy today? How can I be more purposeful today? And how can I be more connected today? And now that they're older and they understand, I ask them those same questions. And then when we have dinner, we'll talk about how were you healthy? How were you purposeful? How were you connected? And it's just a great way to keep them in practice because I know dad's going to ask, got to <laughs> make something up, you know? <laughs> um, but it's just, it's just keeping it fresh and, and it's not forcing it. But I think that they're um, they're picking up on it. I'm, I'm a big believer that you know kids pay more attention to you than we think they do, and so actions just speak so much louder than words. And so by me taking care of my my daily practices of meditation and journaling and reading and um, showing up for others, my morning walks, they know like when Dad's out the door at six a.m. what I'm doing. Um, I'm not forcing it on them, but I feel like it's it's sinking in. And so I think for, for any dad, for any mom, for anyone out there, children, as much as they cause gray hair, um, they are by far my greatest teachers. 
they, I teach them, but they teach me more than I think they realize. Yeah. All, all our kids do. They're, yeah. they're pretty amazing. Yeah. So what are some of the common, common struggles that you see your clients show up with is, are there some things that just keep coming up over and over again that, that folks struggle with? I'd say the biggest one lately when I, when I meet people who reach out and say, oh, you help people write books. I'm like, well, that's one of the things I do. Um, I said, I'm more into, you know, do you have a story to tell that can help people? Because those are the stories that I, I really love to hear. Um, a lot of people will say, yeah, I've got an interesting story, but I don't think it matters. It's, it's just me. I'm just, you know, I'm nothing special. I'm not Brene Brown. No one's going to line up at a bookstore to buy my book. And I just will look at them and say, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that what you have inside of you that's locked away, first of all, couldn't change one life, which I guarantee you it probably would. Just one person will find inspiration, motivation, and probably be inspired to tell their story because you told yours. But how do you know that that could not have the same kind of effect. Do you think Brene felt that before she wrote her first book? I guarantee you she did because she's talked about it numerous times. So why, why are you any different? And they don't have an answer. And I'll say, so, so tell your story. And don't, don't worry about the outcome. Don't worry about the masses. Worry about the one. Write it for that one person who you know in your heart you can help. And so with every person I work with who struggles with my story doesn't matter, I can get them at least to admit that it will matter to one person. And so for the entirety of our program together, I will just remind them, who are you writing this for? Who are you showing up for today? And they'll describe the person. It's me in a younger version, or it's so-and-so. I'll, I'll have them create an avatar of that one person who they're writing this for. So when they start to doubt themselves when we're not recording, when you're going through the work we've done, listening to the recordings, going through your notes, like, what is my why? It's her, it's me 20 years ago, you know? So I, I'd say the biggest challenge is just reminding people and shining a light on the fact that you have a story to tell and it matters because mm -hmm. When you tell your story, you're going to help someone who maybe will tell theirs. And if you can feel that energy for yourself and someone else does it, again, it's the ripple, the cascading. Don't, don't worry about Amazon bestseller. That'll come. People do it all the time. It probably will come for you. But don't let that be what drives you. Not right now. Right now, it's got to be all connect these two and, and then speak it get it out. Again, it's the archaeology work. It's it's the digging. It's going to be messy. It's it's I've been told like what you do is like like a story doula. And so like a birth, it's messy. It's awkward. It's kind of painful, you know? But it's beautiful at the end of the day. And it's literally just the first draft. It's going to go through stages of development to eventually get to your audience. So don't worry about what we're doing as being like it. This is like the marathon is long. I'm getting you from the starting line to that first leg in a really powerful way. So let's just focus on that because that's what I'm showing up for you with. I'm going to be right alongside you running and then I'm going to pass the baton off to an editor, a writing coach, someone who can help develop this into a podcast, you know, submit the Ted talk, you know, I mean, whatever it is, like the baton will just go to get you to that finish line. So I just, I really say that for most people, it's just getting started and getting over their own um, mental obstacles of doing it in the first place. You bring up such a good point. It's if it helps one person, that's all that matters. And then there's a matters. ripple effect from there. We're in a social media society where we always have to have numbers and it's like, yeah. mm, bullshit. <laughs> yeah. And I really believe, I think from doing this work enough, Linda, you asked me like, what, what have I learned from this? And I, I believe in the human spirit and the human heart. 
I think that every person on this planet wants to help. And I think that we're born with love. We're born to give. This is one way of doing it. Tell your story. And I think that if more people would just kind of change the way we think about storytelling, publishing, book writing, and this whole idea of publishing, like it, it doesn't have to be a book with an ISBN number. Like when you write a letter and you send it out or you put an email together and it's published, it's, it's, it's public domain now. It's free for anyone. That person can post it online. It's published. So when you write something and give it to someone else, you are published. So this whole idea of it's got to be on a hardbound book and it's got to be on a bookshelf, like that's that's one way to reach people. But we're living it. We have we have never been in a moment in history where the ability to share our story in a countless number of ways. YouTube, TikTok, podcasts, you know, just email blasts, you know, I mean, so the medium is the delivery method. It's what the container is, the TV show, the book, the blog, the pod. it's what's inside the media. That's you. And that's what I remind people, like you are the media. The book is not the media. That's the medium that people are opening up. What's inside is you. That's what I care about. And that's what I try to bring people back to is what connects people, what's going to make that book explode, what's going to make people subscribe to your YouTube channel is you. And that's really the energy that I try to keep them focused in. And that that ability to master that voice, master their story, like become a great storyteller, that's what gets people's attention. And, and, and that's, that's how you can change lives. I think we've pretty much heard it for this whole past hour, but Greg, what's your why? Oh God. It's, it's, um, Oh, what gets me out of bed is just the ability to connect on, on a level with people that I've, I've, understood for years that I have an energy that connects people that lets people feel seen and heard. But I don't think that it's just contained in this body. I think this body is a vessel to take this energy that comes natural that I don't really think about. Again, it's kind of the unconsciousness of my massage work. I just did it, but people kept coming. And I was like, why are they coming? I now know why they came, but it's not for me to just sit here and just be like, oh, the master connector and the story, he can open up people. And I want to help you do the same now. I can show people how to do what I do. So, so it really is taking on more of like this teacher, guide, support, coach, whatever you want to call it to just, I mean, my method, I'll, I give it away. I mean, I, I frankly want to get to a point where I'm doing enough story projects and I'm sending it off to my team to do the interviews and to create the content. I'm just out teaching the method, getting people inspired to tell their story, sending them to my team to record. We start getting them on the marathon uh, race. And all the while, I'm giving everyone the tools. This is how you connect. This is how you connect to yourself, the micro to macro approach. That is my why, is the UN visits, going into schools and teaching teachers and kids the method, going into homes and teaching parents the method, but starting with themselves and then take it to your kids. Um, so my why is, is I want to, I, I just want to help connect the disconnected. Mm, that's beautiful. Kind of a oh, long-winded answer. <laughs> uh, no, I love it. I love it. How can people find you, Greg? I'll post the information below, but why don't you go ahead and let everybody know as well? Yeah. So, so I, I, 
I have found that um, I'm I'm not like the best with social media, but I understand it's important. So I feel like my home, like my comfort platform is Facebook. So people can find me on Facebook and it's uh, Greg, G-R-E-G-G, Gonzalez with an S at the end. Or they can just look up the Speakeasy Method, uh, Speakeasy Media. They'll f- probably find it online. Um, I have a website that explains the method. I'm retooling Speakeasy Media page right now. I'm actually going to put together more of a connection page that really just highlights this idea of connection. But um, one of my favorite things is meeting new people. And like when people out reach out and will be introduced through either a, a friend, a recent connection, like seriously, nothing lights me up more because that answers one of those three questions I ask myself in the morning of being healthy, more purposeful and connected. How I be more connected is when I meet somebody new. And it just kind of, I'm into this feeling of like finding other light makers and like understanding like what what makes you so bright? How do you shine your light and how do you give that light to others? And so this idea of just meeting people who have light in them and how do you help? How do you serve? That's the story that I really want to learn from people. So I'd love for people out there to reach out and tell me what makes you shine? Um, how do you serve? How do you show up? And it could be, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, I'm a stay-at-home mom. Um, I work at a grocery store, whatever that is, but that act of service, those people absolutely light my day up. So, um, so yeah, I would say, I would say Facebook, um, or just looking up speakeasy method would be the easiest. Awesome. Thank you, Greg, for being here today. I so appreciate you. I had a blast. Thank you, Linda. So appreciate you. All right. Let's say goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.